It's a blessing to be here this afternoon, though, with you guys and to be a part of this conference. Um, thank you, Tom, for the invitation to speak at this conference. I know this is, uh, this is about the magazine and, 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 and what you guys have accomplished and, of course, about Jesus Christ, but about also how the Lord has used the magazine over the years. And um, you guys got to make sure you check out the display and the cafe and all of the all of the magazine covers over the years, I've spent some time just looking at all of them, and it's pretty amazing just to see all the different pictures and the magazine covers and the things that you covered, Tom, and um, it's, it's just a blessing to see all that the Lord has done and to have it documented for us and to be laid out in that way. It's a huge blessing, and um, I think you got started like around 1997 or something like that it was when I saw the first magazine cover date was, and I had just graduated from high school at that point and was trying to make my way in the world. Um, but when I came to Calvary Chapel, it was, um, it was as a Marine. And I remember uh, finally finding a church where the first day I came in and somebody invited me to go to lunch with them on the first Sunday. And I couldn't believe it. I was blown away. I'd gone to so many churches as a Marine, walking in, not knowing anybody, you know, in a foreign area. You go into church and you sit down and nobody approaches you and nobody talks to you. Until I found Calvary Chapel Vista and I sit down in the back and a young man named Isaiah Thompson came up and was like, hey, a bunch of us go to lunch after church. You want to go with me? And I was like, sure. And I've never looked back since. You know, I've been a part of Calvary Chapel ever since. And it was the very first time I began to sit under the teaching of the, of the Word of God. And um, what really drew me to the church there in Vista was Pastor Rob's sincerity, his simplicity, and his going to this thing right here, the, the Word of God, and making this a foundational part of everything we did at church. And I'll tell you what, I felt like a sponge for the first several years. Uh, there was the first time I'd been in a church that was just teaching methodically through the Word verse by verse, and um, I still have notebooks of the notes that I was taking from Pastor Rob. As I, would, I started going every chance I could get. I was there on Friday nights at the beach bonfire with the college group. I was there on Saturday nights for the Bible study with the college group. I was there on Sundays uh, for church, Sunday, after, or Sunday evenings for, uh, through the, the, the Bible, Bible study, and then Wednesday nights. Um, and it was just a really blessed time in my life. It was the first time I heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. First time that I was baptized by the Holy Spirit in my life as a Christian and made a huge difference in my life. I began to start being a witness there uh, in the Marine Corps. Stopped using foul language. That was a miracle in and of itself, you know, I'm telling you. Um, and, and just seeing the Lord do so many things um, as I was just coming alive, as I was hearing the Bible be taught to me and everything. And and then later, I was at the church so much, I guess they were like, let's just bring this guy on staff, you know? And so uh, eventually they invited me to come on. They had an opening in the high school ministry, not as the pastor, but they just needed a helper. They didn't need an assistant. And so I remember I showed up at work. My first three weeks of work at Calvary Chapel was me painting the outside of the church with a really long brush, you know? <laughs> that, was my, that was my job. I thought I was, all right, I'm in ministry, you know? All right, we're going to be teaching the word and blah, blah, blah. No, I didn't do any of that stuff. I... I, I uh, painted the outside of the building, cleaned the bathrooms, walked around and found smudges on the walls, you know, and scrubbed them off. I think, John, you might have been on staff at Vista for a little while, right, as well? And so you probably remember scrubbing some walls or vacuuming the sanctuary and doing all that stuff there. But uh, they just trained you up. They just trained us up in ministry. That's what they did. And, and ministry was not some huge, you know, thing. It's just you serve. You just serve, and that's what, what you do. Whatever the need is, you do it, and that's always stuck with me, and I think that's why I've, I've stayed with Calvary Chapel. I mean, it's just a, it's full of a bunch of guys that love the Lord and um, guys that, you know, show you an example of, um, you know, being bold enough and dumb enough just to believe God's Word, and let's just do what God's Word says, and, and that is, is it, it's that simplicity, it's that sincerity, it's that uh, reliance on the Holy Spirit that's kept me um, just, just realizing that this is where I need to be. This is what I need to be doing. Um, and so I'm really thankful to the Calvary Chapel movement. I'm really thankful to the Calvary Chapel magazine. Yes, I was suspicious of Tom Price over in Hungary because he was hanging around that Hungarian gal a lot. And I, I, I went to my pastor. I'm like, should, we say, should I say something to this guy? Should, do I need to, like, is he okay? You know, because I didn't know what he was doing. But God was doing things. God was doing things there. That was, that was pretty awesome. And uh, so, yeah, but I, I thank God for the magazine. I thank God for the Calvary Chapel movement. Um, and I hope that we continue uh, 
you know, I think this movement, I, th- I think it was in the Jesus Revolution movie, it said something very uh, profound. Uh, Chuck Smith said, hey, this movement's not based on feelings and emotions, it's based on the Word of God. And I think that's why the, the movement is still here today, and I think that's why the movement is going to continue until the return of Jesus Christ to take up the church. It's because we're not focused on a man, we're not focused on emotionalism, we're not focused on all the sideshow we are going to try to stay grounded on the Word of God. At least that's my hope, that's my prayer, that's my desire. And um, as long as we do that, I think we're, do, we're, we're going to be steered in the right direction because you can't go wrong with God's Word. He gave us this, this Bible so that we could have uh, you know, His instructions uh, of how, how the church is supposed to look like, what, what Christian life is supposed to look like. And So today, if you've got your Bibles, let's go to Titus chapter 3. I want to look at verses 1 through 8 with you. And um, I think I've got until a little after two, so I'll try to get through this. And then we've got a break, and then we'll be hearing from Pastor Lloyd. And man, I'm excited to get to hear from uh, uh, Pastor Ken as well today, today, and then um, and John Randall as well. We're we're excited to have you guys here. Thanks for coming. Titus chapter three. We'll be looking at verses one through eight. And I titled the message today: God's grace to live in our time so let me go ahead and pray and then we'll actually let's read the let's read through the verses and then i'll pray titus 3 beginning in verse 1 says remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey to be ready for every good work to speak evil of no one to be peaceable gentle showing all humility to all men for we ourselves were also once foolish disobedient deceived serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And verse 8 says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this passage in Titus that you have given to us. And Lord, for all of your counsel in the Word of God. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us through the Spirit as we open this book and as we open our hearts and our minds to your Word. Lord, we thank you also for the Calvary Chapel magazine and the Calvary Chapel movement. We thank you for Tom and Ogie, Lord, and their heart, their dedication, and and their staff, Lord, the writers and the photographers that have helped him make all of those additions happen. And Lord, we thank you most of all for the gift of the Holy Spirit that resides in us and, Lord, draws us to you and fills us on a daily basis, Lord, so that we can We can do this thing called Christianity, and I just pray that today you would speak to our hearts what you have for your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, quickly, I want to just cover the context of the letter to Titus to give us some background before we just dive into the third chapter and look at these eight verses. They're, They're not alone, of course. The letter of Titus was written with a sense of urgency as Paul is sensing the Lord's imminent return. And as he senses that, he writes in in chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, about about the blessed hope that we have. The blessed hope of the rapture, you guys. The the, the fact that Jesus is one day going to appear in the sky to take up the church to be with him forever. And man, now more than ever, the church needs that comforting doctrine to be taught in in the church. Um, Paul has this strong sense of responsibility here to finish his ministry well. And the progress of the gospel, though, here in Crete, where he's writing to uh, to Titus, a young pastor, it's being hindered here by the rebellious people, he calls them, who are are engaging in these useless debates and are deceiving others. Can you believe that the church would get distracted with such useless things in such an important time? 
Well, we're there, aren't we? The, the church is distracted by all kinds of weird things right now. And I mean, we've got, we, we've got all kinds of weird stuff happening in the church. And the progress of the gospel can be hindered by those things. But at the same time, we know that in spirit-filled believers, God works in and through their lives. This letter was written to Titus, a young pastor there in Crete, who was sent there by Paul to set the church in order. And much in the same spirit as 1 Timothy, this letter is, is also written around the same time. And so it's a great letter for pastors. It's a great letter for church leaders today because it's full of practical advice on how to oversee and shepherd the church in uh, uh, tough times. Now, there's, I want to give you a quick overview of the book of Titus uh, so that we can see uh, what, we're, what we're diving into here. First of all, Titus is being exhorted to do and to teach four basic things in the letter to Titus from Paul. First of all, he's to ordain elders and to set the church in order. Secondly, he's to rebuke the false teachers. And then thirdly, he's to speak sound doctrine to that church so that they're healthy and prepared for what is coming. And then fourthly, he's to maintain a lifestyle of doing good works and to encourage and exhort the church to do the same. Well, Paul is not teaching us that we are saved by good works, but he is telling us that good works are the natural fruit of a life that has been forever changed because of God's amazing grace. Can I get an amen? Amen. And this is what brings us to the message here in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. I want to focus with you today on how God's grace enables us to live godly lives in the midst of our generation. You see, every generation of the church has lived with the urgency and the expectancy that Christ could return at any moment. And this certainly describes us today. And if you've been awake and reading any of the news, my friends, then you know we are living in the last days. We are living at a time that is closer than ever before to the appearing of Jesus Christ to take up His bride, the church. And so I want to focus on how God's grace enables us to live out our Christian lives now when it's needed more than ever. In our verses here, Paul gives us two main points that exhort us to live godly lives in our context as Christians in our world. First of all, he talks about our obligations. We have obligations as Christians, as biblical citizens. Yes, we have a duty as Christians in the world that we live in. And then secondly, he talks about our motives for biblical citizenship. So let's, talk, let's start in verses 1 and 2 where we see our obligations. He says in verse 1, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. So notice here, there's actually two areas given to us that Christians have an obligation here to live as biblical citizens in the place that God has planted us. Whether it was Crete and Titus and the church on, and, and the Cretans, or whether it's Calvary Chapel, Reno Sparks, here in Reno, in Washoe County, or Dayton Valley, or Urington, or wherever it is that God has placed you. First of all, in relation to the government. The chapter begins here with this reminder that Christians are to be subject to rulers and authorities, that we're to obey them, and we're to be ready for every good work. And as Paul is writing this to Titus, he knew that the Cretans actually needed this reminder because they could be a pretty rough and tumble kind of people. The Cretans, in fact, had a reputation that preceded them. In fact, in chapter 1, Paul quotes a prophet of their own saying that Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. How would you like to have that for a reputation? <laughs> oh yeah, those folks in Reno, man, they're liars, evil beasts, and gluttons, man. <laughs> what, what a reputation to have. Commentator Donald Guthrie says this, that Cretans were notorious for untruthfulness is strikingly confirmed by the Greek language, containing a word, kretizo, meaning to lie. The accompanying elements in their unenviable reputation give the measure of their sensuousness. Evil brutes represents a maliciousness akin to the more savage animal creation, while lazy gluttons describes their uncontrolled greed. 
So here, the church at Titus, he needed to be reminded, hey, these, these people, these Christians, they're being saved in this culture and they're coming into the church, but they need to be reminded that as Christians, as believers, we're to set an example. And that example is to be citizens who respected and obeyed the governmental authorities, recognizing that it is God who is ultimately in control of all things. And my friends, the same is true for us today. The same is still true for us as Christians today. And we need to be careful. We need to watch our attitudes. We need to be careful that we're not filled with arrogance and walking around and trying to uh, be obnoxiously, uh, uh, you know, the, the source of changes in our society. We need to remember that, hey, as Christians, we have a dual citizenship. We are citizens of heaven. That is, our, that, that is our home. Our, our eternal destiny is in heaven. That's true. Yet at the same time, Paul is reminding Titus and the Cretans that they are also citizens of the government where God has placed them. You know, Paul himself knew this. And Paul lived as a biblical citizen, a citizen of God's kingdom, but also at the same time a Roman citizen. In fact, if you study the New Testament, Paul claimed his Roman citizenship on more than one occasion and claimed his rights as a Roman citizen. And so for us today who say that, hey, we probably shouldn't get involved in politics or we, shouldn't, we, we need to stay out of these kinds of things, hey, we should study this. We should study the life of Paul. We should study the life of Jesus. You think that Jesus wasn't political? Oh, he was very political. He, he, he brought up all kinds of touchy subjects, and he didn't shy away from addressing the moral issues of his day. And so because, especially in our context here in America, we have a constitution of the United States of America, and under that constitution, guess what? We the people are the government. And so politics, at its most basic level, is just the implementing of policies that are going to govern our lives. And so as Christians, we should care about these things. And we should be getting involved in voting in who is going to be governing, who is going to be deciding what those policies that govern our lives will be. We should be interested in all of these things. We should be contributing our ideas and the truths and the principles from God's Word into the political realm. Because that is what will lead to life. That is what leads to human flourishing. It leads to a blessing in the lives of our neighbors and a blessing in our own lives. And that's a powerful good, my friends. And that's part of what it means to be ready for every good work as a Christian who is living respectfully and in honor towards the government is that we recognize our part to play in that as well and we're ready for every good work. Engaging in the public square as a church. Being involved in bringing about the changes that are needed in our society. My friends, we need more of this today. We need more churches to be awakened to what the Bible teaches us about uh, our relationship to the governing authorities. The second area that we're obligated to live as biblical citizens is in relation to fellow citizens. In verse 2 there, look at that. He says, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, Gentle, showing all humility to all men. I love this. Paul tells us how we are to do this. How do we go about relating uh, in our obligation to the government? We, we do this in, in, in a Christian way, in a humble way. We speak evil of no one. We're peaceable. We're gentle. We show all humility. This is the mark of someone who's controlled by the Holy Spirit, right? Someone who's co controlled by the Holy Spirit is able to be gentle, able to, 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 to have exercise self-control because the Holy Spirit is filling them. It's not coming from their flesh. You know, too many Christians, we want to engage with some of these things, but we want to do it in a, in a way like, like, like how the world does it. We want to do it in the flesh. But listen, if we do that in the flesh, we enter into the realm of the enemy in the flesh, we're, we're going to face defeat. We're going to be ridiculed. We're going to be humiliated. We've, we've got to remember that as we engage with government, as we engage in the public square, relate to our neighbors and our society, we interact with and are involved with our communities, our conduct needs to be marked by the Word of God. It needs to be marked by the Holy Spirit. This is what our reputation should be like as we serve God in our communities and neighborhoods that God has placed us to be in. Now, Paul begins to drill down on the reasons behind 
our obligations to live godly lives as biblical citizens. And this is actually the second and, and, and really the most important part of our message today. This is where we really want to drill down because the motive behind why we do what we do, behind why we live out our duties, if we don't have that, then, then we're missing the whole point. So let's jump into this in verse 3. We see the motive from our past life. It says in verse 3, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Wow. Verse 3 is basically a general testimony of every single person before they're in Christ. If we're being honest, as we read verse 3 here, and we, we remember back to our lives before the good news about Jesus Christ entered into the picture, we were all lost. We, we were like this. We can find these same elements in our hearts before we were in Christ. And you know what? Sometimes we still struggle with these things after we're in Christ because of the flesh, because of the enemy, because of the world. But, but for sure, before Christ, we were foolish. We were disobedient. We were deceived. We were serving various lusts and pleasures and living with hatred in our hearts. I, I, I can remember as a young man, you know, growing up, you know, there in Fernley is where I went to high school, right down the road here. And I remember a bunch of my friends, we would get together, we'd all pile into our cars, and we'd come here to Reno, and we'd go to these punk rock concerts. There was a lot of them back then. And straight edge was a thing, you know, and, you know, straight edge, you didn't drink, you didn't do drugs, but man, you sure got violent, and you sure, you sure tore it up uh, when you went to these concerts. And I remember being in the pits at these concerts, and me and my friends, we would just jump into the middle of these pits and we would just look for the biggest guy in that pit and we would just go running right at him, you know, just to see what would happen, you know. And we would often get dinged up and bruised and bloodied, you know, and it was a wild time. And I look back on some of that stuff and I think, man, how foolish I was. How crazy, how silly, how dumb some of that stuff was that I was doing. Uh, you know, I, I could remember carrying around grudges and bitterness in my heart towards, you know, other, other guys on football teams and things like that and thinking about ways I was going to take them out, you know, and, and, and all of that vengeful thinking and all of that hateful thinking that filled my heart. You know, it, it, was, all, it was all works of the flesh. It was all who I was before Christ came into my life. And, you know, it's a good thing sometimes to remember where you've come from, to think back to that time where before you were in Christ, what, what your life was like, what you were living for, the vanity of it, the emptiness, the foolishness, the deceitfulness of sin, the, the, the emptiness of this world, it's so good sometimes to look back, not to glorify it, not to boast in it in any way, but just to remember, hey, that's, I was lost. I was in darkness, and I was destined for judgment. I was destined for an eternal torment in hell without Christ. But thanks be to God for His amazing grace towards us, right? That's what brings us here to the second part of this message. Look at the motive from our present salvation in verses 4-7. through seven. Verse 4 says, But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, you probably already have that underlined, but just in case you don't, just scrub a highlight marker over those verses, man. These are jewels. These are gems. God is giving us precious promises that remind us of our true identity after the gospel comes into our hearts and our lives. In other words, everything about our lives is changed by the kindness and the love of God, our Savior. Praise God. Notice there in verse 4, we see the source of our salvation. It says, but when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Now, my friends, that's the gospel. God initiated our salvation in sending His own Son, Jesus Christ. I love this. This is the kindness and the love of God being seen in the act of sending Jesus Christ as our Savior. 
So my friend, if you're here today and you've doubted that God loves you, don't ever doubt it. Don't ever doubt that God loves you. The fact that Jesus Christ came to this earth is living proof that the love of God is for you. That God loves you. And, and we, we know from Romans chapter 5 that that love is demonstrated for us and that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. It's an amazing love that God has. It's an unconditional love. And it's bigger than any sin you've ever committed. His grace abounds where our sin, where our sin is great. His grace is greater, my friends. His love is greater. We see the basis of our salvation there in verse 5. It says that not by works of righteousness which ye have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. This verse tells us that the basis of our salvation is not you and me being good enough, but it's God's mercy. Thank goodness for that. If it was by my own good works, I'd be in big trouble. How many Christians know this? But we don't live this way, right guys? We try real hard to do works of righteousness to be accepted by God. We think, if I just try harder, I'll be good enough for God. You know, I lived that way myself as a Christian for a long period of time, many years, trying to do it in my own strength, thinking that the basis for my salvation was me doing good things to outweigh the bad things so that I'd be be in good with God. You know, I can remember playing football games as a teenager in high school and and thinking to myself, all right, God, please bless me on this play. And if you'll bless me on this play, God, I'll make sure and read my Bible every day this week, God, you know. And then I'd get tackled in the backfield and I'd be like, all right, Lord, I repent. I'm sorry, you know. It was a works-based relationship. But, but, But here we see the basis of salvation has nothing to do with your works. Nothing to do with your goodness. It has everything to do with the mercy of God. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. God looks at us and he says, I love, it says God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes on him shall be saved or should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the mercy of God. We also see the means of our salvation there in verse 5. And then going into verse 6, it says, Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. I love this. The means of our salvation, beginning there with the washing of regeneration. That washing of regeneration is what happens when you believe the Gospel. The good news that Jesus Christ has died for our sins and rose again from the grave and He's conquered sin and the grave. That word, regeneration, simply means new birth. The the Greek word is new birth. And that that just points us right back to John 3.16. Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night and asking him, how can a man be born again? And and, and, and Jesus begins to explain to him that, hey, you're born through the womb once, but you have to be born again. There has to be a spiritual rebirth. That happens, and that's a supernatural thing that only God does in the heart and the life of a believer. But he does it through faith. So this washing of regeneration, is, it, it's a washing. Not only are we washed, though, by the blood, we're washed clean by the blood of Jesus when we're born again, but notice there it's also the renewing of the Holy Spirit. This is the means that God has provided for our salvation. The regeneration and the renewing here of the Holy Spirit. See, it's the work of the Holy Spirit to renew us in Christ as new creations, to make us ready for a new life of service to God. Now, I remember when I first started going to Calvary Chapel of Vista, and Pastor Rob was teaching through the book of Acts, and we got to chapter 2, and he was talking about the, 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 the filling of the Holy Spirit, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that is there at the beginning of chapter 2. And I had never heard that taught before in my, all my Christian life. And at the end of that service, they had prayer teams in the front. And he said, hey, if anybody wants to be baptized in the Holy Spirit today, come on down. And I thought, you know what? I was scared to get up in front of all those people and come down in front, of course. But you know what I realized? I was like, you know what? This is something I I, I definitely need because I can't live the Christian life. I've been trying on my own for years. And I'm just sputtering out. I'm spinning my wheels. I got no power. That's how I felt. I was frustrated as a Christian. And, and so I took Pastor Robert's word. I came down to the front. 
And I didn't know what to expect. I thought maybe they were going to smack me on the forehead and I was going to fall over and start shaking or something, you know. You've, you've seen all the weird stuff that's out there. You never know what's going to happen, you know. So I came down and of course it, I, was, I was scared too. I, maybe I'd start speaking out in some language, some unknown tongue, you know. Nothing like that happened. Just a regular guy, come down to a regular guy, puts his hand on my shoulder, says, hey, you believe by faith that you can have the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I said, yeah, I want that. He goes, okay, let's pray. He prays for me. Nothing happened. No, no hair raising on the back of my neck. Nothing weird going on. All right, brother. Have a great week. You know, have a great week. Go back and sit down. You know, the next day I get up, though, and <clears throat> I get up with a desire and a hunger to read the Word of God. Something that I didn't realize was the missing ingredient in my life as a Christian, that I was not rooted and grounded in Christ through the, the promises of Scripture. And so it was through that, that, that moment of, of being baptized by the Holy Spirit where nothing seemingly happened in the physical realm, yet in the spiritual realm, the Holy Spirit came upon me and He filled me with a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Something I'd never been filled with before. And I began to read my Bible. I began to, to, to get into the Word of God. And guess what? I began to see big changes in my life. You guys know the military is a place where there's a lot of foul language. There's a lot of, a lot of cussing that goes on. And I, that was one of the, the, the things that I struggled with as a Christian was my mouth. And, and, and it was there after that baptism of the Holy Spirit and after a daily coming to the Word with a hunger going, all right, Lord, what do you have for me today? What do you want to speak to me today? God, what nugget do you have for me to chew on and meditate as I go through my day today? As the, that's how the Lord began to get inside and, and, and to take control over those things like my foul language and the lustful thoughts and all of these other things that were uh, in my heart. And, and, and the Lord began to give me victory step by step through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the renewing of the Holy Spirit that goes on there. And it's, it's all linked together. That, that word wash, it actually means to baptize. And, and so if you could picture when, when we hear the gospel and that good news is proclaimed and we put our faith and trust in Jesus, there's an amazing thing that happens as the Holy Spirit comes upon us and washes us, washes our mind clean. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. The Holy Spirit fills us and gives us the mind of Christ so that we can go and live in victory, the victory that He has won for us. It's an amazing thing to be a Christian. It's an amazing privilege to be in Christ. We, 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 we take for granted, don't we, the amazing blessings that we receive from knowing Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus knows that if we're to live as Christians in this world, we're going to need the Holy Spirit. And so notice the word abundantly there in verse 6. It says, whom he poured out on us abundantly. In other words, Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit abundantly upon our lives. I love that. God's not a miser. God's not, you know, stingy. God's like, if you come and you ask by faith, I'm going to give generously, abundantly, above what you can uh, even expect. That's our God. He's that kind of a God. It reminds me of the verse also in James chapter 1 where it talks about God's wisdom. If we'll come seeking God's wisdom and asking for that wisdom, God loves to give His wisdom. He also loves to give His Holy Spirit to those who humble themselves and will ask Him for that wisdom renewing of the Holy Spirit. The word renew there, that means a complete change for the better. Don't you love that? It's a complete change for the better. Now, in verse 7, we see the results of our salvation. It says that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so, my friends, as a people that are saved by Jesus, we're new creations in Him, and we have been given a new identity. Our identity is no longer that of being a slave to sin, but now we are justified, just as if I'd never sinned. God sees you and I, the believers, as in Christ, by faith, righteous and accepted in His sight, fully accepted in His sight. Isn't that a wonderful thought? You know, I spent a lot of my life striving to be accepted striving, looking for affirmation wherever I could find it, only to see that it was in the gospel where we find every single thing that we need. 
our, our, our identity is completed through a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're cleansed, we're forgiven, we're accepted, all because of what Jesus has done. That wonderful thought only gets more wonderful there at the end of verse 7. It says that, that we've been saved for a future, doesn't it? T Titus 3.7 there tells us that we are heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I like what William Barclay says in his study Bible. He says that the Christian is the man or the woman who knows the wonder of past sin forgiven, the thrill of present life with Christ, and the hope of the greater life which is yet to be. Man, I like that. The thrill of the present life with Christ. Man, if you think Christianity is boring, you're going to the wrong church. You're following the wrong Jesus. You got the wrong Bible. Because Christianity is anything but boring. And when we realize what we've been saved from, called to, and expectantly looking for, there's only two things we can do. Rejoice and get busy. Rejoice and get busy. If you're bored or depressed, it shouldn't be for long. Because God's going to call you out of that. He's got things for you to do. That brings us to the end of the message, and that is our motive from the connection between doctrine and conduct is found there in verse 8. We read, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. So as we wrap this up, guys, we cannot leave this without connecting the doctrine to everyday life to conduct you know that that i think has been some of the reason why we're facing the problems in our world today that we're facing or at least here in our nation for sure you know it, it's been said that uh you know politics is downstream from culture culture is downstream from the church the church is what is is has failed the, the, the pulpits that aren't preaching the gospel, but, but the Christians who are hearing the doctrine, who are not going out and living out in the conduct. And so this is where, guys, we, we were exhorted here in verse 8 to connect doctrine to what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is why we, Calvary Chapel Sparks, this is why we are, are, are involved in our community. We've, we've got a great... Uh, uh, a lot of folks here, a great body of people here that are involved in some way in our community. And, and it's amazing. And I love that because it means that they're taking the word of God and they're connecting it to what they do on an everyday basis. And they're saying, this is what matters. This is my faith lived out in action in public. And it's so important, especially in these last days, you know, we're not, we're not, you know, called to, to go build bunkers and stack ammo and get a bunch of canned goods and get ready to live out the apocalypse, okay? No, that's, that's not the Christian mandate. The Christian mandate is occupy until he comes. And, and, and this is what we need to be about, guys. We need, to, we need to make that connection that because of what God has done in our hearts and in our lives, hey, we can't stay silent. We can't keep it in. We've got to get out and we've got to share that in our lives and conduct. So, as we conclude in these last days that we're living in, let us live as good citizens whose lives are centered every day, knowing that our identity is in the good news of Jesus Christ, full of good works in His name. Amen? Let's, let's pray. God, we pray for Your grace in our lives to do Your will in the time that You've given to us. Lord, we don't know how much time we have left. You could be you could be on your way right now. And we pray that you are. But Lord, we don't know uh, exactly how much time we have left. So Lord, we just want to ask you for your grace to be poured out upon us. And Lord, that if you tarry, we would see uh, 100 more magazine covers posted up in the foyer out there, Lord. Um, and see many, many more great things that you have done through Christians, through us that are filled with the Spirit and and, and recognize that you are Lord, that you are a Savior. We love you, Jesus. We just pray your blessing upon the other speakers and, and on the messages that you're going to share with us throughout the rest of the day and throughout tomorrow. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.